Welcome back to the ECB Forum on Central Banking. Please do continue to share your comments on social media under the hashtag ECB Forum. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce the editor of the Financial Times, Ula Kalaf, who kindly accepted our invitation to moderate this year's Distinguished Policy Panel. Rula will be joining us from the FT's headquarters in, Rulen, in London. So good afternoon and over to you. Hello and um, thank you for the invitation and thank you to the audience for, for joining us this afternoon. I am in lockdown London. It's been more than nine months since the coronavirus pandemic um, hit Europe and the US. And after a period of recovery over the summer, many economies are shut once again as countries battle second or third waves of the virus. The economic cost has been tremendous, but perhaps not as severe as some had feared. That's because the response to the pandemic has been forceful and fast. The monetary response was extraordinary and it was supported by a massive fiscal response. Where do we go from here? What is the fallout from a health emergency of uncertain duration? And what does it pretend for monetary policy? No one is better positioned to give us answers than my three panelists. Jay Powell, Chair of the Federal Reserve, Christine Lagarde, President of the ECB, and Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England. First, let me start by asking you about some good news we've had recently. Uh, the election of Joe Biden in the US and the prospect of a vaccine that will be available before the end of the year. How does that change the economic outlook? To what extent does it change the economic outlook? Chair Powell, over to you first. Sure, so um, from our standpoint, I think we can say a couple of things about the, um, the status of our recovery. First, it's been faster and stronger than, than we expected. Um, second, it's slowing a bit, and that's understandable given the, the uh, outsized pace of the gains in, in May and June. Third, it's been uneven. So it's been uh, better for people with uh, higher incomes than for lower incomes, still 20% unemployment among, uh, among higher unemployment among people in the lowest quartile. And it's also incomplete. Uh, so we still have 10 million people here who are out of work. Um, so uh, I would say that the main risk we see today, we, we, we do see the, the uh, economy continuing on a solid path of recovery, but the main risk we see of that to that is clearly the further spread of the disease here in the United States. Uh, we've got new cases at a record level. Uh, we've seen a number of states begin to reimpose limited uh, activity restrictions, and people may lose confidence that it's safe to go out. Uh, we've said from the beginning that the economy will not fully recover until people are confident that it's safe to resume activities involving crowds of people. You mentioned the vaccine, so that is uh, certainly good and welcome news for the medium term, although significant challenges and uncertainties remain about timing, um, production, distribution, and the efficacy for different groups. Um, and from our standpoint, it's just too soon to assess with any confidence the implications of the news for the path of the economy, especially in the near term. And I would say with the virus now spreading, spreading, the next few months could be challenging. Um, you're, you also asked about the election. And of course, Rula, you will not be surprised to find that I'm very reluctant to comment on the election. I won't be, I won't be surprised, but I'll be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't comment directly or indirectly, other than to say that this is a good time to take a step back and let the institutions of our democracy continue to do our jobs. At the Fed here, everyone should know that we will continue to do what we do every day, which is to serve all Americans and support the economy during this difficult time. Uh, Governor, Governor Bailey, I'm, I'm going to ask you to comment on the same question. Well, I'm going and, to... and you are a bit freer than, um, <laughs> than Chair Powell to comment on the U.S. election. I'm going to politely take the same line on the U.S. election. And of course, we follow it with uh, with great uh, interest and intensely. Um, 
and we'll, we'll we'll just watch and see how it plays out on the vaccine though let me let me i mean in a sense support and uh, reinforce what jay said it's good news obviously it, it, it's encouraging and we need we need we need encouraging signs but but um it's true as um jay was saying that um yeah, it, it's of course not here yet in terms of the uh, the implementation of it we conditioned our forecast, which we published last week, on the basis that there would progressively be improvements in, uh, in, in the health situation and treatment of, of COVID. So this is obviously news that is supportive of that. But the one point I, I would emphasize is that this, I mean, this year we have seen, I think, the highest levels of, in a sense, calibrated uncertainty in the economic outlook, certainly in the life of our current monetary policy arrangements, which is nearly a quarter of a century. And what is important is that I think gradually, as we get more news on the vaccine situation, I hope that not only will it obviously give encouragement and hope, but it will also start to begin to reduce that level of uncertainty uh, over the outlook for the future. Now, we're not, we're not really there yet, as, as Jay has said, but that is important, I think, for, uh, for, the, for, for monetary policy, because we are having to make monetary policy in conditions of extreme uncertainty. Got the noise out there. Um, President Lagarde, I I can't see you actually on my uh, on my screen right now, but I know that um, you're there. H how encouraged are you by the vaccine, and how encouraged are you by the U.S. election? Uh, Rula, you don't miss much by not seeing me, and I can see you and I can hear you well, so it's perfect. Um, look, that's the way I, I look at it. We were nine months ago, as you said, facing a sea of uncertainty. Um, everything was uncertain. And as a result of that, forecasting the outlook for the economy was more than an art. It was, it was really uh, exceptionally difficult, uh, as exceptional was the economic crisis that was a result of the health situation that we inherited. But we are clearly seeing a little less of uncertainty on several fronts. Uh, the fact that uh, the US election has now taken place has removed some uncertainty. Uh, the fact that uh, Brexit is progressing has probably attenuated the anxiety, but not removed the uncertainty yet. And the fact that a vaccine has been announced uh, and seems to be 90% efficient and uh, likely to be approved in early 2021 is also removing some uncertainty. So from that sort of huge, uh, big river of uncertainty, we see the other side now. And what I think is going to be critically important going forward is that the policies that have been in place, which have been extremely helpful, both monetary policy and fiscal policy, uh, help bridge over to the other side of the river and continue to support the economy so that there is as little long-lasting damage as possible. But I don't want to you know, be exuberant about this vaccination uh, because there are still uh, uncertainty about the logistic, about the transportation, about the rolling out, about the fabrication, about the number of people uh, that will be vaccinated in the course of 21 so that we can reach uh, the herd immunity, which, which will then give us more certainty from the health point of view, which in turn will facilitate not only our economic forecast, but the decisions that will be made by economic agents going forward in terms of consumption, in terms of investment, in terms of um, jobs, of course. Um, I think a word of uh, your word of caution is important because we saw the market reaction to the vaccine news, of course. Uh, but just anecdotally, uh, the, the mood seems to have changed, uh, at least, you know, around me or the people that, that I've seen, that suddenly people see an end to, to the pandemic. But staying with the, with the macro outlook and with, uh, with you, uh, President Lagarde, um, you said yesterday that the second wave poses no less danger to the economy than the first. Um, and I'm just wondering, because surely there's been some uh, adaptation. Economies, businesses, businesses have adapted, supply chains uh, have adapted, and we now all know how to, how to work remotely. 
Yes, uh, you're right. We have learned from the first wave. Uh, and there are things that we can do better, that we can anticipate better. And certainly governments have learned, particularly in this part of the world in Europe, that a complete lockdown is probably not the most efficient way to deal with uh, the second wave that we are facing. But what I was referring to is a little bit different. It's the risk that uh, consumers, investors, business owners do not regard that anymore as, as a one-off, as this, this big hurdle that we had to jump, those two months lockdown, but that it continues to be a lasting matter with recurrence or recurrences of pandemics, with recurrences of contagion waves, with new lockdown measures. And that as a result of that, the, the behaviors, uh, the decisions be impaired, that people go back into yet more saving of a precautionary nature, uh, that those businesses that have managed to to, to, to last and to sustain themselves thanks to the various loans and, and availability of financing, eventually decide that it's no longer worth the effort and give up. So th that's, that's the risk that I'm, I'm concerned about. And of course, you know, the, the whole hysteresis that can affect the labor market as a result of waves that would last long and that would really disrupt uh, the economy. Um. Governor Bailey, um, I wanted to ask you realistically how much power can still come from uh, stimulus, whether it's QE, negative rates um, or guidance, given the already extremely low um, rates of expected real future interest rates? Well, I think the first thing I'd say on that is that we have had to, I think, change the way in which we think about monetary policy mm -hmm. operations. Um, you know, we, we, if we can remember it, we used to have a world where there was essentially one instrument and the, the decisions were around the sort of, you know, the setting of that instrument. So rates, in other words. Now it's changed, and it's, it, of course it had changed in the post-financial crisis world, but it's changed even more in, in the last, in the course of this year. That not, not only do we have to think about how we calibrate an instrument, but we have to think about what instruments we've got in the toolbox, um, uh, and then which ones we, yeah, you know, we bring out and use. And that's a very different world. So we've had to, we've had to innovate uh, during the course of this year. And so, you know, the thing that I think is most interesting about the question is that when I look back to what we were saying in answer to your question back in February, say, which seems like an almost sort of period of prehistory now. Um, it was radically different from what we're saying today. Back in mm -hmm. February, we were certainly in, in our case saying, you know, we can see a real, a, a real sort of constraint on policy. We didn't think pre-COVID that we were particularly near to that constraint, but we were aware of it. Now we've gone way through that constraint in the last nine months, and we've we've had to innovate. We've had to innovate in the world of QE, had to innovate in the world of guidance. By the way, we've we've had to innovate in QE not only in terms of, um, you know, the, the scale of it, but also thinking about the pace of it and thinking about you know, what actually, you know, what is it that we're responding to, and and how and what state of the world are we in, and how does how do these tools work? Because they are state contingent. And we've also had to do, I think, to borrow a phrase from the US, actually, we've had to think about what I sort of tend to call, you know, QE for the financial sector and QE for, or, or, or quantitative measures for Main Street, as it were. So, you know, many of us have introduced, you know, new instruments in that field directly in response to that. So, it, my honestly question really is we've had to innovate and we would have to go on innovating, I think, in terms of, of looking really hard and imaginatively at the toolkit that we've got. So I, I, I'm optimistic on that front, just on the basis of how we've had to respond this year. But of course, going back to what we were saying, you know, I fervently hope that as we you know, begin to see progress on the medical fronts, you know, that will become less of an issue. I, I want to come back in a minute to the the long-term consequences for, for monetary policy. Mm. Um, but first, I just want to turn to um, Chair Powell. Um, and I want to ask you about um, the coordination between monetary and and, fis and between the monetary and fiscal response, um, which has been uh, impressive certainly um, in in Europe. Why has the Fed been less successful in pressing Congress and the White House on fiscal stimulus? Well, so we I think we've said from the very beginning that um, this crisis in particular is one that will require a response from all of government. 
And that's because it's it's really not a typical downturn. This is a downturn where a full employment economy uh, suddenly experienced mass unemployment due to this external shock, really a natural disaster. And monetary policy works through stimulating aggregate demand, and that's important now. But ultimately, there was a job to replace lost incomes there. And I would say that our Congress stepped in, and um, there hasn't been a, a faster or stronger response uh, from Congress to an economic emergency really since the Great Depression. You know, the CARES Act and the other um, laws that they passed really more than fully offset uh, lost income in the aggregate. Now, there will be people for whom that is not true, but it was quite a strong response. And you see still high levels of savings on the balance sheets of households. And we, we, we've sort of uh, not experienced the downside cases that we were quite worried about of mass insolvencies of companies and businesses and so far. So, so far, so good, I would say. The second, really the most important leg of all, of course, is the healthcare leg. You know, as, as I said earlier, there's no uh, full recovery without confidence that it's safe to undertake all activities. Um, and we had our part to do, which, which I think we've done. So I would also say, though, that the, the, the path forward is going to be challenging for a number of reasons, and I'm sure we'll get into some of them, yeah. and that my sense is that we will need to do more and that Congress may need to do more as well in fiscal policy. The actual particulars of that are, are up to Congress and not up to us, but uh, I do think it's likely that more will need to be done in time. But I would say that our response to date has really been quite strong. Um, President um, Lagarde, um, I want to talk to you about uh, coordination and and cooperation. The, fin in the during the financial crisis, there was a sense of greater coordination on on monetary uh, policy. How would how would you describe um, the the coordination in response to the pandemic? Uh, Rula, if you if you are talking about uh, the coordination between us, between the, uh, the national central banks, I would say that it has been spectacular. Um, I mean, both um, Jay and, and Andrew will remember vividly uh, those days and those nights when we, uh, we had to collectively respond and put in place that portion of the global financial safety net that we can offer, which has to do with the swap of, cur of currencies. And uh, that's, that was particularly the case uh, in the early days of the crisis in mid-March, when, when clearly there was this, this dash for cash that translated into uh, short-term dollar uh, needs on, on the part of uh, many participants in the markets. And the three of us plus three other large central banks reactivated uh, the, the swap lines that we had between us in order to make sure that there would be plenty of, of supply of the, of the uh, currency that was most in demand. So we did that. And as far as the ECB is concerned, we also uh, reached out to other national central banks in, uh, in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, in various places, and reactivated pre-existing uh, swap lines. We also opened some special repo lines with other banks and set up a new instrument as well that is a, a European repo uh, facility that is available as well. So I think that amongst us, we have been extremely engaged, active, we coordinated, uh, we, we faced uh, the storm uh, together and we, we really closed ranks. If what you're talking about is coordination between monetary authorities and fiscal authorities, certainly in the euro area, uh, there was, contrary to what I saw myself during the great financial crisis when I was on the other side in, in the fiscal front, we saw a much more efficient coordination, a prompt uh, response on the part of both uh, the fiscal authorities, and certainly we were uh, very quick and, and, and big in order to respond to the situation. So I would say that on both accounts, amongst central banks and between um, here in, in the euro area, between the central bank and the uh, and the national as well as the European authorities, really uh, much improved coordination and cooperation. Uh, we had asked the audience uh, beforehand to submit certain questions, and several of them uh, have raised the issue of cooperation. And one of the questions is whether central banks um, should be coordinating their action during more normal time. 
rather than during crises. Um, what would you say to that? You know, I, I would say that there is a lot of um, cooperation, exchange of views, uh, forum, places where we, uh, we try to uh, coordinate as much as possible and deliver on our respective mandates. You know, we have different mandates, let's, let's recognize that, but we have a lot in common as well. And whether it is within the, uh, the Financial Stability Board, uh, within the, uh, the BIS and uh, Basel committees, I mean, we, we, we do uh, talk to each other a lot and we do compare notes and we, we try to cooperate as, uh, as is appropriate in accordance with our respective mandate. That's the way I see it, at least. But before I turn to the to the longer term um, consequences, um, let me ask you, uh, Governor uh, Bailey, but also Chair uh, Powell, to comment on this. Um, there is a, quite a bit of criticism that lower rate policies are creating unhealthy asset bubbles. And there's a question about whether there needs, they need to be accompanied by tougher financial regulation. Governor? Well, first of all, I, I mean, I think it's important to understand that the, the, there are the channels through which uh, particularly quantitative easing works. So I, I don't think we should be surprised um, at, at the general movement of asset prices in response to that. It is part of the transmission effect. But you're right that what we have to watch is the financial stability consequences of it. And uh, as Christine was just saying, I mean, there's been an enormous amount of work um, over the last decade or more in a sense, under the, under the sort of aegis of the Financial Stability Board to tackle these issues. Now, when I think, if you look at the questions, what have we learned in the last uh, eight or nine months on that front? I think I would divide it into to two parts. On, without wishing to, to this is going to sound complacent, but it's not, it's not intended to be. But what I will say is that I think on the banking side, I think we have, you know, this is the first major test of the post-financial crisis reforms. And I think so far the, the banking system has stood up to the task. And although it sounds a, a very sort of cliche thing to say, I'll say it. I mean, what we wanted was a banking system that supported economies, not economies that supported the banking system, uh, which unfortunately was the experience of the financial crisis. And I think we have seen that actually. So I think the, you know, the, the reforms we've put in place, the counter cyclical policy approach that we've put in place so far, I think has stood up. Now, in the non-banking world, if you go back to March, you know, Jay referred to the dash for cash earlier, we, we have and, and did see things that did cause us concern, but more particularly, actually, and, and this goes back to Christine's point about, about the use of swaps, for instance, required very major interventions, major interventions domestically, major interventions internationally through the, through the swaps and so on. And it has pointed to areas where you know, there are concerns. The FSB, again, is leading that work, very important work on non-bank financial institutions, really asking two big questions. One is, what do we learn about fragilities and systemic fragilities here? given that the non-bank world is so much bigger. Secondly, given that the central banks had to intervene so substantially back in March in the context of the, the you know, stresses in financial markets, what do we conclude from that in terms of the, you know, the, the improvements we can make both in the regulation and regulatory mm -hmm. side in that world, but also in terms of the way in which central banks operate, because it took us into into new areas. It, took, it, it gave us new challenges in terms of the non-bank part, non-bank financial world. Chair Powell. So I would broaden the question a little, if I may, and just to say that if you look back over the last thirty years, what you've seen is since inflation became more or less under control. You've seen a series of very long expansions that have not ended because of high inflation and central bank policy tightening, but instead have ended through the buildup of financial imbalances and ultimately through financial instability. Mm. And I think we, we finally in, internalized that lesson as a result of the global financial crisis and went to work to dramatically strengthen and make more resilient the banking system and also other aspect, many other aspects of the financial system. So I think you asked about low rates. The fact of low rates is actually a small, we are now in an era of low rates, but really that trend was in place beforehand. So 
we've been at that for a decade now, and I would agree with everything Andrew said. And I would add that you know I, th I think the, the first draft of history is that our banks have done well in this crisis so far. I would emphasize so far. Uh, it's not at all time for complacency, but um, and, and as Andrew said, there, there's what we will do now is look across mostly the, the, the non the, uh, non bank financial intermediation sector where there were some issues. And I think the, the FSB and all of us are looking carefully at what we might learn from that and what things we might do. So I, I do think one, we took away from the last crisis a, a very strong focus on financial stability. We have a division here. We have a public framework for assessing financial stability. We published a financial stability report earlier this week. We did, so our, our framework is out there for public comment. We monitor on an ongoing basis and all of that is a complete sea change from the way we approach these issues before the global financial crisis. Um, and we're, I, I think it's very much on us in this era of, of low for long rates to keep at that, and, and we will. Um, President Lagarde, um, how vulnerable do you think our companies' um, balance sheets and banks' balance sheets, particularly, to, to a prolonged uh, downturn? I, I think a lot of bankers that I talk to um, are relieved um, that the first wave wasn't um, as dramatic. Um, but we have yet to see a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of uh, job losses. Uh, do you think that they might be complacent? Well, Rula, two, two things. One is, uh, as I said yesterday, I think it's, it's critically important that uh, we can maintain uh, the, the financing conditions that have been operating well in order to, to sustain the economy so far and to stabilize it and to make sure that uh, you know, companies can, can borrow and benefit from almost the lowest interest rates um, ever at the moment that households can get mortgages at the lowest ever uh, rate, interest rates at the moment. So continuing, continuing to provide those, those financing terms at that level over a sufficiently long period of time. And I think that you know, the level is important, but the maturity over which those terms will be available is also of critical importance. And as this crisis is continuing from one wave to the other, as the lockdown measures are uh, hampering, hammering the, uh, the economy from one set of lockdowns to the other, it is really, really important that financing be accommodative and that the, uh, the maturity be sufficiently long so that the refinancing by the corporates uh, be, be at, at terms that can be expected and that will support the economy. As far as the banks are concerned, uh, I would completely subscribe to what uh, both Andrew and Jay have said. Uh, through the last uh, 13 years, particularly post the great financial crisis and the great efforts uh, undertaken by the Financial Stability Board, by the regulatory authorities around the world, the banks are much more solid. Uh, they are much more capitalized. The leverage is, is much more under control. Uh, the liquidity ratios are imposing sufficient caution on, 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 on the banks. And as a result of that, uh, they as Andrew said, they operated as, as uh, facilitators, as, uh, as solution finders, as opposed to, to being at the, at the core of the problem, as was the case 12, 13 years ago. But I would say that in the current circumstances, and I would completely second what Jay said when he said so far, I think it's also necessary that banks be very attentive uh, to, to their current balance sheets and to particularly the uh, the health of the corporate accounts that they finance. Because it is clear that in some sectors in particular, there will be difficulties, there will be bankruptcies, uh, there will be exit from certain sectors, and that it will take time for those that exit to actually re-enter some, somehow and somewhere in a different area of business. So in the meantime, clearly, uh, some impairments will have to be acknowledged, some uh, non-performing loans will have to be provisions. And I think it's in the interest of the, the banking sector and of financial stability at large to do that in a, in a, in a reasonable, sensible, uh, transitional way so that uh, there is no um, NPL shock uh, that, that, we would, uh, that we would fear if it, if it was to happen all of a sudden. I have to say that 
the measures that, was, that were taken from a fiscal point of view in order to provide moratorium, in order to provide those particular schemes that attenuated uh, the hardship of the crisis have been a great shield, but that shield will eventually be lifted at some stage. And I hope that that happens gradually as the provisioning uh, takes place gradually as well. Um, uh, Governor Bailey, I wonder if you could ans um, answer the same question, but put it more um, um, in, in light of the B word, Brexit. Um, how comfortable are you that the financial sector is ready for, for, Brex uh, for Brexit? And if I could also ask, uh, how worried are you about a no-deal Brexit? Well, on the financial sector, we've, I mean, done a very substantial amount of work with the financial sector over a number of years now, and we've published the assessment of the state of that preparatory work regularly in our financial stability reports. And I do think the financial sector has taken it very seriously. I think an enormous amount of preparation has gone on. So if I had to sort of, in a sense, you know, calibrate you know, our view on that, I think the financial sector has been able to do a lot more preparation. Um, whether whether there are you know, further decisions on equivalence or not, I think the financial sector is is ready, as it were, in that sense for what, what will come. I think it's been harder for, the, for, for quite a large part of the non-financial sector, because obviously there is the uncertainty about the, uh, the question of the trade agreement, uh, and, that, and that uncertainty remains outstanding. And, and, and that, that is much more of a material issue in terms of preparations. It's, it's in many, many ways quite binary, obviously, for, yeah. for, for many firms in that sense. Now, we do a lot of work in, in thinking about our you know, our view of obviously our forecast the economy and also our work on financial stability to assess preparedness. Um, and, and obviously a lot of work has gone on, notwithstanding the uncertainty. You know, we said that in, in, in the report we published last week, we said we, as a sort of a broad approximation, we thought, you know, around about 70% of affected firms, you know, were, you know, had done a lot of preparations. I have to tell you, though, when you ask them, they, they do have a tendency to say the following. They will say, we're as ready as we can be. <laughs> I've, heard that. I've heard that one, we too. Heard that as well. Now, that, of course, is, leaves you wondering, so what do they mean by can be? <laughs> and, and that is an issue, clearly. Um, now, let me just say this. I mean, you know, I... I I've said, I've said it many times, I'll say it again. You know, the best outcome here is there is a trade agreement all round. I'm not making a particularly a UK point here. I think the best outcome all round is a trade agreement. And I really hope there will be one. I'm, you know, I'm encouraged that those discussions are, and the, you know, it's, the process is going on. Uh, and that would, of course, help. But let's be clear, of course, any trade agreement now is a change from what we've had up till now, because it the UK is leaving the customs union, leaving the single market. So there will be an adjustment process. Now, I would hope that in, in, if there is a trade agreement, there will be a spirit of goodwill around it and that some of the inevitable changes of processes that will, you know, will disrupt things in terms of adjustment can be managed more smoothly. Uh, you know, I'd be more concerned if, you know, if there isn't a trade agreement, frankly, and we default to the sort of WTO terms, because that might denote also that there would, that spirit of goodwill might not be there, frankly. So I think there's every reason now to, to, to hope and, uh, I say, encourage the trade agreement to happen. But it's obviously not for us to determine the outcome. That's, that's very clear. Would you use uh, hope, encourage, would you use the word expect? Are you expecting? Um, no, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to prejudge, because I'm not part of the process. I'm not going to prejudge uh, where it's got to. Um, so I'm going to stick to hope and encourage. Those are good verbs, I think, for this uh, this context. Okay. Um, uh, Chair Powell, um, recent change um, is uh, that the Fed will not now treat the employment mandate as a broad-based and inclusive goal, uh, which recognizes that macro policy has to work for the margins of, of the labor market. Um, could you tell us what's led to this to this change and what the likely impact will be? Sure. So um, a couple of things. I, I, one, one, I would say that um, the longstanding uh, disparities in income 
uh, between within groups and between groups in our are a feature of our economy. In fact, inequality between groups and within groups has been has been increasing, and so we we've noted that that's something that holds back the U.S. economy as a general matter. And so we focus more on those than we have in the past, uh, and called those things out as ways for the U.S. economy to to grow, in, in so that everybody can take part and contribute to and benefit from broad prosperity. Um, the more recent thing, actually, is that we were able to observe um, very low unemployment by historical standards for an extended period of time. Unemployment was between three and a half and four percent for two full years. And on the, we didn't see high inflation. We didn't see high wage inflation. We didn't see high price inflation. We didn't see any sort of uh, notable problems in the, in the labor market, misallocation and things like that. And what we did see was that in the seventh, eighth, and ninth year of the prior very long expansion, the benefits began to flow more to people at the lower end of the income spectrum. And that was wages. That was uh, record low gaps between, for example, white and black unemployment. It was labor force participation critically, which is an area where the United States has lagged many other uh, yeah. advanced economies. We saw labor force participation rising well above what the trend had been. So we saw great benefits. And uh, that was one of the things that motivated that you pointed to one change in, in, the, in the monetary policy review that we just did. So what we said is that we'll react to shortfalls in, in, uh, in employment from full employment uh, and that we regard uh, maximum employment, which is our statutory goal, as a broad and inclusive goal. So that's meant to, that's meant to pull both of those thoughts in and those are two key aspects of, of, of our new framework. Um, President Lagarde, you have, a, you have a different mandate, but I did want you um, to come in here um, because one of the one of the things that we've noticed in this crisis is that the burden has not been evenly shared. Um, and there's been a disproportionate impact on minorities, on uh, women, and I think that's something you've talked about before. Um, and, and a widening of the, um, of the divide in wealth and in economic uh, mobility. How worried are you about lasting damage and can monetary policy play a role? Arula, you are completely correct uh, in uh, referring to the uneven uh, consequences. And it's, it's, it's becoming very clear as we are uh, collecting numbers. It's the women who have been affected uh, quite significantly more than men. It is young people who've been affected significantly more than uh, the average um, uh, worker. And on those two categories in particular, uh, it's, it's likely to actually uh, leave uh, long-lasting scars. And why do I say that? Because when, particularly for the young people, because there have been research now to show that when young people are um, not given access to the, uh, to the job market or lose access because they are on short term, because they are uh, on, on uh, uh, internship, it stays with them for another 10 or 15 years. And the jobs that they have 10 or 15 years later is at a lower pay, it's uh, less uh, uh, qualified. So the scarring effect is empirically demonstrated, and it is clear that in this particular crisis, young people are more affected. It's, it's, it's obvious. For the women, it has a different um, uh, consequence in a way, because it's largely attributable to the sectorial aspect of the crisis. When you look at those sectors that are most affected, you're talking about tourism, accommodation, transportation, uh, the, the retail sector, which are sectors that employ largely more women than men and generally at the lower end of the wage scale. And those um, households uh, typically are those that have a propensity to consume that is higher and if you take that out of the, of the market, clearly the consumption is not going to be pushed up uh, by those wage earners that have essentially left the labor market. They're not either employed nor are they unemployed. They've, they're discouraged. They know that it's not going to pay back if they go back into the labor market. So yes, I'm concerned about that. And, uh, and although it is not our mandate, our mandate is price stability. 
Uh, I think that it's one of the reasons why on this particular crisis, it's so important that fiscal can be a, a very active agent in order to address uh, the current situation, in order to maintain the income of those who are losing their job for a period of time, and in order to provide for the training and the skill sets that will help them uh, get to the other side of the river with an ability to get a job, uh, probably in a different sector. Uh, Governor Bailey, you've talked about the new economy, the economy of the, f of the future. What are, what are the changes that you see? Well, like Joe and Christine, I do think that the effects have been very uneven. And of course, I don't, in a way, that's not surprising. I mean, we've seen a very uneven recovery so far. Uh, and that reflects the fact that obviously those parts of the economy and those sectors that you know, involve close human interaction uh, are much more heavily affected, and, and those those sectors undoubtedly, as, as Jane and Christine have said, have a you know, much greater concentration of, of low-paid workers uh, in them, and also you know, also distributions you know, with gender and ethnicity as well, and that's that's very troubling and, and important. Now, I do think, and if we come back to where we started this discussion, I mean, I do think that obviously the you know the more rapid the the the, the, the sustained recovery from this, the, the less the longer term scarring will be because more firms will be able to come through, more act activity will revive, uh, and that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, and, and that's why we've, I mean, we've tended to take the view that scarring will, I'm afraid, be a feature of, 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 of the economy, but it won't necessarily be as large as some of the, some of some forecasters think it is. Because I think they, some of them, I suspect, rely rather too much on history. And if you go back to certainly the 80s and the 90s, where you saw much larger scarring and, and, and much more sustained scarring. That was because it was very much a sort of structural move out of heavy industry, out of heavy manufacturing into services, out of things like coal mining, uh, where you had far more capital scrapping, far more long-term unemployment. I, I'm more optimistic on that front in that I think this is a you know, this, these will probably be movements within sectors as much as between sectors, but it is still very serious. I don't want to play it down at all. I agree with Christine and Jay on this. Monetary policy, you know, it, it, it has a role, but let's be clear, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not something that we can do either alone or be the primary focus on. Although I do think also that the very large amount of work we all do to understand economic analysis and to understand our economies has, a, I hope, a wider benefit uh, in terms of framing, thinking about how to address these issues. Just looking at the, at the future, what we do know, Chair Powell, is that um, this crisis has accelerated certain trends, digitalization, uh, for example, um, and this will lead to certain uh, changes in, in economies. There are firms that will never recover from the crisis. There are potentially sectors uh, that, may, that may never recover from the crisis. We won't be traveling um, as much, for, for example. Um, what worries you most about the long-term impact? I would agree that um, what this crisis is in the process of doing is it is accelerating a lot of pre-existing uh, technological change. So technological change raises productivity generally, and over long periods of time, those gains tend to be broadly shared. But in the short term, that may or may not be the case. And I, I along with many others, We'll leave social media out of it, by the way, in terms of adding to <clears throat> productivity. I would not sure I would say that for social media, but <clears throat> for other kinds of technology, I would say it. And um, in this particular uh, situation, I, I would worry that the changes, we're, we're not going back to the same economy. We're going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers who, as Andrew just mentioned, you know, the, it's uh, relatively low paid public facing workers in the uh, service sector who are bearing the brunt. This is largely minorities and women or, or skewed toward minorities and women and relatively low paid. So those people are going to struggle to get back to work in their old jobs or in, in many cases in new jobs. So, I mean, I think you'll see more telework. You'll see probably the acceleration of, of automation um, all of that was in the process of happening, but you're going to see much more of it. And I, I guess that for me, the main takeaway from all of this is that 
um, even after the unemployment rate goes down and the economy is, you know, and there's a vaccine, there's going to be a probably a, a substantial group of workers who are going to need support as they find their way in the post-pandemic economy, because it's going to be different in some fundamental ways. Um, President Lagarde, would you like would you like to come in on this? Uh, yeah, thank you, Rula, because I think that um, it, it's a coin that has two sides. And yes, sectors will be affected and will be transformed, and there will be um, losses and liabilities and 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 and, and damage. But sectors will also be transformed in a positive way. If you look at, for instance, um, medical services, which typically were not uh, heavily digitalized and where the personal contact was still regarded as the, 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 the prevalent uh, way of providing medical services. This is radically changing at the moment. And I'm sure that Jay has those numbers as well. But, you know, it was something like 11% of Americans who uh, used telemedicine. It's now moved up to almost 50%. And of those 50%, most of them are quite happy with what they're getting, and they're happy to actually continue with it. So in the same way, uh, you know, payments have been also significantly transformed, in, you know, closer to home in a way, where a lot of digital payments are accelerating, are pushing us in the direction of exploring alternative uh, modes of payments. And there, there will be transformation that will be beneficial. Uh, there will be sectors uh, that or services that were not available that can be now provided from anywhere to somewhere, you know, to use the David Goodhart uh, uh, analogies. And, and that can be extremely beneficial. Plus, uh, you know, being a little bit from my corner here in Europe, it will accelerate digitalization, which is an area where Europe was a little bit uh, lagging behind and where clearly much progress had to be made. So, to the extent that this is supported by the, the, the training that is necessary, the skill setting, resetting, however it's called now, uh, I think that it will be beneficial for, uh, for productivity in, in Europe in particular. If I could come um, back in there, Rula, it's, it's really please, interesting. Yes. So just to reinforce what Christina said, I mean, we've had a, certainly a story of low productivity growth for 10 years now. And that is part of the story about low interest rates, I mean, structurally low interest rates. So. Yeah, I don't want to under, un, I don't want to lessen the, the, the challenge of, of transition, but I really reinforce what Christine has just said that there are opportunities here, and it's interesting if you look at productivity across sectors because retailing is actually one of the sectors that in recent years has had stronger productivity growth where we've seen structural change. So Christine's right, I think, to sort of point to opportunities as well. Um, President Lagarde mentioned uh, digital currencies. We have a question from from the audience. Um, and several members of the audience are asking how central banks see the prospects for, for central bank digital currencies, and also whether this would risk crowding out cash and non-cash electronic uh, payments. Um, let's start with um, Chair Powell. So um, here at the Fed and in the United States, we're committed to carefully and thoughtfully evaluating the potential costs and benefits of a central bank digital currency, which we all call a CBDC, for the U.S. economy, for our payment system, and also for the international uh, uh, implications. We've been actively participating with uh, Andrew and Christine and other central banks at, uh, at the BIS to look at this, and we feel that's been a very productive collaboration. We haven't made a decision to issue a central bank digital currency. And we think there's quite a lot of work yet to be done as we uh, as we engage with public constituencies here in the United States and around the world um, before making a decision. Also, the dollar is the world's uh, uh, principal reserve currency, and I, I assure you that we will approach that question with with great care. From our standpoint, uh, the main focus is on on whether and how uh, a CBDC could improve what is already a safe, effective, and dynamic domestic payment system. We actually do still have strong demand for cash here, which is, I think is different than uh, than, than some other uh, jurisdictions. So we really would need this to be done in a way that does not preempt the use of cash or the use of other uh, private digital currencies uh, in, or, or, uh, or non-central bank digital currencies, uh, such as the Fed now payment uh, thing that we've, that we've announced. I, the last thing I'll say is, um, 
you know, we, we feel an obligation to be on the on the frontier of research to, on technology and and uh, policy development on this. But we, as the as the as the main reserve currency, we do feel it's critical that we that we get it right, as opposed to try to be the first. You know, in a way, we're we're the incumbent reserve currency, and so we're going to be very careful and and uh, engage quite extensively on this before we make a decision. Uh, President Lagarde, there's an expectation the ECB will be first. We're not racing to be first. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, a digital euro will not be a substitute for cash. It will be a, a complement to cash. And clearly it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not a nicety, it's not a tantrum. It is something that uh, if it is uh, cheaper, faster, more secure uh, for um, the users, then we should explore it. If it is going to contribute to a better monetary sovereignty, a better autonomy uh, for um, the euro area, uh, <clears throat> I think we should explore it. And uh, you know, if it is going to facilitate cross-border payments, which are very laborious in quite a few corners uh, of uh, our big world, then we should explore it. So that's the reason why we have um, launched a consultation uh, in mid-October that will be completed in mid-January. And at that point in time, we will make the decision as to whether or not we go forward with a digital euro. And uh, my, my hunch, but this is a decision that will be taken collectively, is that we might well go in that direction, which does not mean that a digital euro is going to be available right away because obviously uh, we are going to have to address all the issues of um, anti-money laundering, uh, financing of terrorism, privacy of um, uh, users and all their information, uh, the appropriate technology that will carry uh, that uh, digital currency. And this is you know, a, a project that will probably take us two, three, four years before it is, before it is launched. Just to give you an indication, uh, the PBOC which, is PBOC, which is the central bank of China, has started exploring this about five years ago. In the same way, uh, Facebook, which is exploring a private stablecoin, uh, has started about four years ago. And their Libra is, is certainly well advanced. But it's also a good reason for all of us to be very attentive to the way in which monetary policy can be secured and monetary transmission uh, can, be, uh, can be safeguarded. So those are the reasons why we are moving ahead and uh, diligently, not, uh, um, not uncautiously. So we will be prudent. We know it will not replace cash, but my hunch is that it will, it will come. There has been, of course, a lot of central bank resistance to Libra, which doesn't, doesn't look to me like it's, it's going to go very, very far. Um, but I was interested in what you said about uh, autonomy. Is, is that a main driver for the ECB? No, I think the, the, the main driver is to respond to, uh, to, to, our, to our customers. What do, what do the people of Europe want? How do they want to pay? How do they want to uh, uh, use, uh, use payments? And it is clear that in some of the uh, Euro area countries, member states, uh, the, the use of cash is significantly declining to the benefit of digital payments. Uh, if you look at a country like uh, Sweden, for instance, if you look at the Netherlands, uh, it's moving extremely fast. So we cannot be... And the pandemic has the accelerated curve. this. The pandemic, the, pandemic. Has, yeah, the pandemic has definitely accelerated that. Instant payment and digital payments have, have increased significantly over the course of the last few months. Yeah. Uh, where, where does the Bank of England stand? First of all, by the way, there's a real paradox of cash, which is that there's no question, and we all observe this and probably a part of it, that the use of cash is, is, decli is decli it was declining before, before the pandemic, and it certainly has during the pandemic. Although I, I agree with Christine that I don't think it's ever going to go, go away. On the other hand, the amount of cash in circulation, the amount of public demands from central banks continues to rise, has continued to rise, so that's a paradox. I think the, from, I think the important thing I would add to this is the private... Um, current, the private stable coin proposals. I mean, for me, a critical public policy issue here is that people, I think, have a, a right to expect certainty of value in the instrument they use to make payments in. So they should not have to worry 
about the value of the of the instrument in which they're making they're exchanging value for in payments. Now I have to say that I think that means that the bar is set very high for private stable coins. And I don't think they've met that bar. They haven't met that bar in my view. And it may be that the answer to that bar is actually central bank digital currency, where obviously you would get that guarantee, you know, that, that certainty of value would be assured because that's what central banks provide. Now that question is yet to be answered, but it is to my mind a critical question. But if I could finish, there's a, there's a number of other very big questions that follow from that, which are more into the sort of heart of central banking which is that if you introduce that instrument, how does it affect monetary policy and financial stability? Because it will do, it will do, both in normal times and in stressed times. And we need to, you know, we're going to have to do a lot of hard work to think through you know, the implications of that. And we, and we will do, we will do. Um, I want I want to turn to uh, climate change, um, and I know um, there have been many questions um, about that. The, the ECB is more active, of course, on the green bond sector, and you are looking, President Lagarde, at, um, at your mandate. Um, how how is the strategic review going, and where 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 do you want to land? <laughs> that I won't say, but it's it's going well. Uh, and uh, clearly, as uh, part of the key, uh, the key elements that we're exploring, um, it won't surprise you if I mention the level of inflation and the, uh, the aim uh, that we have, uh, the horizon that we're looking at, and uh, you know, the relation between inflation and the economy, and uh, the tools that we will use, or the combination of tools that we will use in order to uh, steer demand uh, when it's needed. So those are the, the sort of key planks of, of our strategy review. But we're looking beyond that at, at some, uh, some other elements that actually are directly relevant to our price stability objective. And the one that um, I'm particularly keen on is, is climate change. And, uh, and I've, I've heard many, um, many criticism as to you know, why would we look at that and why can't central banks stick to their mandate and be completely ignorant uh, or completely ignore those other issues. Fair point, except that those matters actually affect price stability. If you have repeated major weather catastrophic situation, if you have repeated drought, it is going to affect our aim, uh, inflation, in a direct way. If we have carbon taxation, it is going to uh, impact our aim in an indirect way. And clearly, if there is so much uncertainty associated with climate change and the risks resulting the, from that, that people actually change their saving behavior, it is going to move uh, down uh, the, uh, the natural interest rates. And that matters to us clearly in, in the way in which we, we define our policies uh, going forward. So if only for those reasons, not to mention the issue of um, appropriate uh, pricing of assets, given that externalities are not necessarily well taken into account. If only for those two reasons that I have just mentioned, uh, we must look into the climate change issues in the way in which they relate to monetary policy and impact on our price stability objective. So that's what we will be doing. No more detail than that. Well, it's pretty good what I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll have to ask, I'll have to ask uh, my correspondents. <laughs> Uh, the uh, Chair Powell, the Fed acknowledged um, that financial risks of uh, the financial risks of climate change in um, the financial stability report. Does that signal more cooperation on climate change be between the Fed and the likely Biden administration? Yeah, I, again, I'm not going to. That, that would be me commenting indirectly on the uh, on the election, which I won't do, but I will comment on the climate change aspect of it. So we do think that, that central banks and that we, the Fed, have a contribution to make here. We also think that climate change is clearly an issue that requires a broader societal, across government, across the private sector response. So we're, we're just part of that. But from our standpoint, we think that the public will expect and has every right to that we will <clears throat> make sure that the financial system is resilient against <clears throat> you know all sorts of major risks including climate change and in our in our financial stability report that we released earlier this week <clears throat> pardon me <clears throat> um, we noted uh, 
the connections between climate change risk and financial stability. So I do think we take those on board. We've been working with the um, network for greening of the financial system. We've been attending those meetings. I, I think we're in the process of applying for membership there now. So there's been significant collaboration, uh, mostly behind the scenes, but central banks around the world are working on this. And what they're real, what we're really working on is, is how do we incorporate climate change risk into all that we do? As Christine mentioned, it has potential implications for monetary policy, for bank regulation, for financial stability. And we're at the, I would say, very early stages of just trying to work through what that means and for, for our goals. I think it is, it, it follows from our assigned legal mandates though, that we, that we do this work. Uh, Governor Bailey, quickly, because I still have one question to all three of you, and I'm running out of time. Oh, very quickly, I'd agree with, with Joe and Christine on this. I'd just add that I think as we think as we were thinking about, you know, investment in the recovery from COVID, then, then thinking about how we can do that and pursue climate change is very, is very important. <sighs> Good. Okay. I usually like to end my panels on a note of optimism, but today I started with optimism. Uh, so my la last question um, is one that I discussed with Martin Wolf, um, our uh, famous economics commentator. And when I said to him, "What would you what would you ask the panelists?" He said, "This. Given where we are today, what frightens you most?" We're gonna we're gonna start with Governor Bailey. Well, I, I think, look, we've lived through this year with a, with a huge shock to the economy. I mean, you know, it, it's the biggest shock since we think in, in the UK since the early 18th century. Entirely unpredictable in terms of its its start. Uh, it, has, it has changed course with incredible speed. You think about the way in which COVID has moved around this year. Now, you know, I, hope we, I hope we can take the optimistic view that you said earlier. But, you know, I think we've had to get used to saying, you know, we are living in a world of huge uncertainty and unpredictability. And that is, that is, you know, I don't like to see that, you know, people of this country, who we have a duty to in, in respect of our public policy objectives, and it's a very important duty, I don't like to see them in that position. It, it's, it's one that makes me very uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, we've got to do everything we can, but it's, it's a very, very difficult place to be in. Chair Powell? So it, for me, it would be the risk that, um, there is some longer run damage to the productive capacity or, of the economy and to people's lives who have been disrupted by the pandemic. And it's it's women who are, who are not by choice out of the labor force. It's mm -hmm. kids who aren't getting the education they should be getting. It's small businesses that, that uh, may, there may be generations of, of intellectual institutional capital that's being destroyed. And it's just workers who are uh, you know out of work for a long period of time and, and losing their a connection to the labor force and really losing the life that they had. So that, that is that is the um, th that's the thing that I worry about the most. Hmm. President Lagarde, you have the last word. OK, two things I'm, I'm frightened of. One is um, the silliness and the hubris that could activate uh, some people to start another war. We just celebrated the 101 anniversary of the First World War and uh, the thought that we could go back into something like that is just horrifying to me. So I hope we'll be wise enough to stay away from that and have the means to diplomatically avoid that. And the second thing that frightens, frightens me, it looks a bit silly, but it's not that silly, is the, 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 mink. the mink. I'm not sure you all have heard about the Danish minks and the millions of them that are being killed at, um, at the moment. Uh, because it really, uh, it's a sign that the virus, which came from this pangolin to man, went from man to mink, and is now going from mink to man. And that would be a, a devastating piece of news because it would mean that any vaccination that is being discovered at the moment would effectively not work on that new transformation of the virus. So I hope we are good enough, wise enough, and uh, can jointly take responsibility to put a stop to that. Well, with worries about Ming and wars, I'm going to have to bring uh, this panel to a close. We, but just to tell you, we are writing a lot about what's happening with the Ming. So um, do turn to the FT.
and you'll read <laughs> what you need about it. Thank you um, so much for, for this panel and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Sugar. Chair Powell, Governor Bailey, thank you, President Lagarde, for certainly diverse, rich uh, debate, which we all enjoyed very much. Let us now turn to another special moment of today's program. So that's when I go. Hello, my name is Christy Jansen. I'm 28 years old and I'm from the Netherlands. Ciao, my name is Antonio Marsi. I am 29 years old and I am from Italy. Ni hao. My name is Ying Jieqi. I'm 32 years old and I'm from China. My work studies monetary policy in economies with domestic and international production chains. I'm interested in the interaction between monetary policy and financial stability. My research is on the role of information choice in macroeconomics and finance. I'm interested in finance and development. I do research in banking and copy finance. My work is about the policies of the European Central Bank, which directly affect the risk premium on the sovereign debt of peripheral countries. I study how long-term investors change their bond holdings after a shift in regulation, and how these changes subsequently affected interest rates. I found that savers choose to get more information about which bank or product they should use for their saving in recessions. My work explores how voter preferences determine financial regulation focusing in particular on the role of political connections in this process. In Sintra, we would have welcomed the young economists on stage. Here we welcome this to our virtual video wall, as it were, for this year's award ceremony. Uh, we're joined by Angelo D'Andrea, Christy Janssen, Alistair McCauley, Antonia Marci, Roxana Mihet, Ing Ji Shi, Magdalena Rola Janicka, Elisa Rubo, and Shuang Wang. Let me now invite to the podium once again President Lagarde, who will announce the winner and then conclude this year's forum. Thank you very much, uh, Thierry. As you mentioned, young people play a critical role and an integral role in shaping the future of Europe and the world. And as you've had a small taste of it in the video that was just played, the ECB's Young Economist competition, now in its seventh year, gives us the invaluable opportunity to hear their fresh perspective, perspectives on the challenges we face. And they are PhD students from across the globe, as you may have noted from their names. Now, those entering this year's competition were invited to submit papers addressing the theme of the forum, that is central banks in a shif shifting world. Submissions were rated both from their academic quality and their policy relevance. We received a total of 103 entries and nine fi finalists, whose name you just heard, who are on screen now, were chosen. Congratulations to all of you who were chosen. Nine, that is four men and five women from six different countries, whose research focused on topics including currency union, financial regulations, and digitalizations, to name a few. And if you in the audience have not yet had a chance, I would strongly encourage you to have a look at the work of all of our finalists on the ECB's website. And I'd like to thank all the forum participants who took the time to vote on the entries. Your votes were taken into account by the members of this year's selection committee, the jury, Chairperson Philip Hartman, Ines Cabral and Glenn Sheppens from the ECB, 
John Mulbauer, Professor of Economics at Newfield College at, in Oxford, and Ricardo Reis, Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. And now, having given my congratulations to all of you, the nine of you, I'm delighted to announce the winner of this year's Young Economist competition, who will take home the prize of 10,000 euros. And the winner is Roxana Mihet, who recently obtained her PhD at New York University and is now an assistant professor at the University of Lausanne for her paper, Who Benefits from Financial Innovation? Congratulations, I see a massive smile on your face and I'm delighted for you, well done. So I'm sure you will all congratulate our winner on this impressive achievement and I hope you can join, join me now on the live stream to give us a short insight into the topic of your paper and the relevance of your research in today's world. So floor is yours. Um, so I would like to start by thanking the president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde, and all of the members of the selection committee for granting me this award. I'm truly humbled to have been selected among such a strong group of brilliant young economists. I've been extremely impressed by uh, their research papers exploring some of the main challenges currently facing our economy. So my own paper is on a subject that has received a lot of attention in the past few years how new financial technology is transforming our society by changing the way people think about their finances. So in this paper, I find that the explosion of new financial information technologies for retail investors does not guarantee broad increases in household wealth. Instead, the sophisticated investors who already have high levels of wealth are most likely to benefit from many of the new technologies. So my research has implications regarding wealth redistribution in today's new world. It also offers suggestions for a guided access to disruptive technologies and capital access, and uh, for the ways in which financial technology should be regulated. I find that to accelerate positive structural change, policymakers need to lay the foundations for fair competition through the democratization of both data and financial technology. So thank you very much again to the selection committee and the president for the opportunity to participate in this competition. And thank you for the prize. I truly feel very honored for being surrounded by uh, so much talent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Roxana. Those are very, uh, very good words and uh, a good description of the, uh, the, the work that you have, you have done. I just want to make sure that you see the, uh, the award that will be shipped instantly to you so that you can receive it, as will be uh, the 10,000 euros. And you'll have to tell us whether you prefer a digital transmission or any other ways of transmitting, but you will get it, I, I, can, I can promise you. So, um, before I formally conclude the, uh, the edition of the, uh, of the forum, let me take uh, this moment to thank all of you for your valued contributions, which have made this year's event uh, such a success. It was different, but it was really fascinating. And I, for myself, have learned a lot by listening to all your presentations and uh, reading your, your, your papers. I would also like to thank each of the speakers, the discussants and the panelists for presenting your research and your perspectives over the last uh, two uh, days. And even though this year's uh, was a virtual one, we have had the opportunity to hear stimulating views and to benefit from the open and very lively discussions that have always characterized the ECB Forum on Central Banking. Let me also uh, thank both myself, but on behalf of all of you, the organizing team at the ECB for the really hard work and for adapting so quickly and being so agile in making this event happen in difficult and changing circumstances. It's almost worked to perfection. And frankly, if you would see the, the backstage, it's a lot of work and it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, long days and short nights for many of them. So I now have the pleasure of announcing the next year's event. It is scheduled to take place from the 28th to the 30th of June. 2021, so mark down in your calendar right away, 28th to 30th of June, 2021, 
with a bit of luck, we will see each other in Sintra. And uh, I want again to thank you all very much for this year event and wish you a pleasant evening and uh, please be well. Congratulations, Roxana. Congrats.